A case from 2010 that never really got the attention it deserved, and a girl whose life was cut short before it even began. Even with the countless twists and turns, 13 years on, it seems today as though justice will never be served. There are still so many questions up in the air. Was there something that was overlooked or missed by accident or on purpose? And has the killer been hiding in plain sight this entire time? This is the bizarre and unsolved case of Annika Smith. And happy new year welcome back to murder and mayhem south african true crime with me your host bella monsoon it's a new year and i have a ton of new cases to delve into and stories that need to be shared but first i want to give a shout out to my two newest patrons on my patreon account ria and martina carson thank you both so much for your support Oh, and before I forget, the Bold by Bella hair color pigment range has officially launched. Yes, my official hair color range is here. So for all of those who comment and message me asking what I use on my hair to get at the colors that I do, you can now find it online on my website. And of course, along with the hair color range, you can find a South African must-have, the Brave by Bella safety keychain range. And for you, my Bella Boos, 10% off everything online for this month. All you need to do is use the code hashtag Bella Boo when checking out online. It's just a little way for me to give back and say thank you for being a part of this epic journey. I literally could not do it without each and every single one of you. For those of you who are new, let me introduce myself. Here it is in a nutshell. I'm a mental health professional who just so happens to be obsessed with makeup, true crime, and uncovering the motives that drive people to do what they do. So what this means is that every single week I post a brand new video looking at a real life crime from a psychological viewpoint. During these episodes I also try to share psychological knowledge and concepts that you may or may not be aware of in an easy to understand format. So if all of that sounds like something that is right up your alley then please do consider subscribing and joining the Balibu family. But if you're more a fan of podcasts, no worries. I will not hold it against you or be upset. You can find me on all major streaming channels for my sister podcast, Murder and Mayhem, South African True Crime. Just a quick disclaimer for today's episode. Today's episode contains material citing assault and murder. As always, I mean absolutely no disrespect to the victim mentioned nor their family. The purpose of this video is purely to shed further light on the heinous crime that was committed while spreading awareness about the psychological nature of the narrative. This episode has been thoroughly researched by myself and includes, where available, real-life accounts, video and footage of individuals involved directly in the case. Today's episode is also unlike any other I have ever done before. But seeing as it was Friday the 13th, I decided I would post something a little bit different. All the information in this episode has been gathered from online articles, databases and media sources. These articles have also been cross-checked thoroughly as I have discovered on many an occasion, you can't always trust an article, no matter where it may come from. But of course, there is always the chance that the information is incorrect, because the media don't always share the full story. And if there is anything that deviates from your knowledge of the events, please feel free to let me know in the comment section and we can open that dialogue. But let's get into it. Our narrative begins with Annika Smith, who was born on the 18th of July 1993 to Charlotte and Johann Smith. She grew up in Pretoria as an only child. In her earlier years, the home was a picture-perfect household, and she had a good relationship with both of her parents. Drawing and painting was an activity that she took extreme pleasure in, especially when it was with her mother. Another passion of hers was the drummers group that she was part of at school. She also loved animals and much of her spare time was spent volunteering at the local zoo. 
When she was 13 years old, though, her parents got divorced. In 2006, her mother would make the move to Otsal, about 1,200 kilometers away in the Western Cape. However, Annika made the choice to stay with her father. She did, however, very soon start to miss her mother as she was only able to see her on school holidays. She was in grade 10 at Gerrit Merritt High School when she decided that she wanted to live with her mother in Otsal. And so in 2009, she made the move and she began to study tourism at the South Cape College. That move, however, was short-lived as after tension between her stepfather and herself, as well as her not enjoying the strict boundaries and rules that were in place, she asked if she could move back to live with her father in Pretoria. She had been in Oton for about nine months. Her mother had agreed to the move and so it seemed that life was back to normal for Annika. Annika was by all means a normal teenager. She was quite a private person but she also had her fair share of rebellion, dyeing her naturally blonde hair black at times and sometimes being called a wild child by some of her school friends. Later accounts stated that she had began drinking in her early teens and regularly smoked. None of those behaviours are considered extremely out of character for some teenagers though. But unlike many others her age, unfortunately Annika would not live to see her 18th birthday. And so the 10th of March 2010 would dawn. It was a normal school day but Annika was not feeling like her normal self. So although she got ready and she got dressed for school in her school uniform, her father would take her to the doctor on their way to school for a checkup. The idea behind doing it this way was that if she was not booked off by the doctor, she would be dressed already to go straight to school and Johan to work. But if she was booked off, then she could just be dropped straight back at home and Johan could still continue to work. At the doctor's office, after Annika was examined, it was determined that she had an ear infection. And so, with that knowledge, she was booked off of school. Her father dropped her off back home and he told her that he would arrange for the local pharmacy to deliver some medication later that day. As he drove away from their Teresa Park home, he didn't realize that that simple interaction with his daughter would be the last time he would ever see her alive. At around 9am that morning, her mother had called her. Not the usual time she would call, as Annika was normally in school at this time, but something in her almost knew. Call it a mother's intuition. As Annika was home, they ended up having a nice long chat, which ended in a request from Annika as she told her mom, Mom, don't forget to get an extra large bottle of beetroot salad for me. And that was the last conversation that Charlotte would ever have with her daughter. A few hours later, around 12pm, the pharmacy driver arrived outside the Smith home. He did not leave his vehicle, but he hooted and waited. At that point, he noticed the front gate was locked and there were two very large dogs running around in the front yard. After waiting a short while further, he then phoned the pharmacy, who in turn contacted Johan. Johan then tried to call Annika, who didn't answer. He, however, assumed that she was sleeping, and so he didn't really give it any further thought. The delivery driver was therefore instructed to leave the premises without completing his delivery. A neighbor would later testify that around 1 p.m., she saw a young blonde girl walk across the Smith driveway with a pram. Remember this, because it could be a clue and make a little bit more sense later. From the later testimony provided by multiple witnesses, a timeline of the events of that day was able to be established. It was thus deduced that the attack on Annika, which resulted in the loss of her life, had occurred between 12pm and 2pm. But what exactly had happened? Well, this is the conclusion that has been drawn from the available evidence. At some point after Johan had dropped Annika home and after she had spoken to her mother, she had received a visitor. A visitor who she was familiar with enough to let into the home, but someone who was not extremely fond of the two large dogs, who also were not keen on people that they didn't know. She had thus confined the pets to the side of the home and she had unlocked the front gate. Keeping the dogs at the side of the home was something that the Smith family often did with new visitors as the dogs also needed time to become familiar with new people otherwise they could get aggressive. 
She had then let this individual into the home and she had prepared two cups of coffee. At this point, we are assuming that one of the cups was for her and the other was for this person. However, the mugs were both left untouched as at this point she was most likely attacked. A scuffle had ensued as the dining room chairs were found toppled over and the dining room table had been pushed to the side. There was also some blood found on the walls. Her body, however, would later be found in her bedroom. Just a quick trigger warning for a graphic description. Annika's body would be discovered undressed from the waist down with a bottle inserted into her. Her body was positioned in a manner to deliver the most shock value to the individual who found her. She had been raped and stabbed multiple times and her throat had been slit. After the life had left her body, both of her hands were also removed at a point between her wrist and her elbow, most likely with a hunting knife. A forensic expert would later determine that this disturbing action would have been committed post-mortem as there was hardly any blood left at the crime scene. This was most likely done as a method to conceal any DNA that may have ended up under her nails if and when she had scratched her attacker. And it was this tragic and disturbing scene that was discovered by her father when he returned home later that day. But I'm going to go in depth with those details and what happened when he got home very soon. In the aftermath of the tragedy, the community was shocked and the friends and family of Annika were heartbroken. On the 20th of March 2010, Annika Smith was laid to rest as friends and family attended her funeral to pay their last respects. With no leads and no suspects, Annika's parents continued to hound the police, checking in as regularly as they could. A local businessman, along with Annika's uncle, would put forward a reward for any information offered that would lead to the capture of Annika's killer. Although some of the best detectives would momentarily weigh in or get involved, like Pete Bailefeld and Detective Mike Van Art, no distinct headway would ever be made into discovering the true offender to this day. Mostly because law enforcement in the beginning were not entirely sure who they were looking for to begin with. And this is where the services of a forensic psychologist came into play. Renowned forensic psychologist and someone that you hear me talk about quite often within my content, Gerard Labeshkachny, was approached shortly after the murder to create an offender profile. In a nutshell, an offender profile is often required when there is a crime committed, particularly of a violent nature with a sexualized theme and no identified suspect. This profile then helps the investigating officer to understand some of the potential motives that drove the crime or elements of the crime and ultimately gives them an idea of what kind of offender they should be looking for. Because it's far easier to find something if you know what you're looking for to begin with, right? Gerard's belief was that this crime was committed by someone who was known to Annika. The level of violence and the nature of the crime scene, coupled with the position that the body was found in, all pointed towards an existing knowledge or relationship between the offender and the victim. This doesn't mean they were necessarily friends though. However, there was potentially a strong emotional connection on behalf of the offender towards Annika that could be deduced by the manner of the murder. If you think back to the crime scene that I described for you, remember the details. There were two coffee mugs on the table. The dogs were confined to the side garden. No items were taken from the home and there were no signs of forced entry on the property. All of these elements combined lead to the belief that this crime was psychologically motivated as material rewards were clearly not the end game. To this day, there are so many theories that are still circulating. As this case is still ongoing and the docket is still open, I will merely be sharing the facts as I have gathered from publicly accessible resources on each of the individuals who were in some way linked to Annika, as it were, the persons of interest. This is not to say, though, that any one of them are guilty or innocent, further than what has been proven so far in a court of law. I will leave those big conclusions up to you, the listener. So listen carefully because here we go. The first person of interest when this case broke and made the news was of course the ex-boyfriend. 
The partner or recent ex-partner of a victim is often, statistically speaking, the first person of interest, especially in a murder that takes place within the victim's home. So, here's what we know about Nico Fenter. Annika and Nico had started dating just three months before her murder. He was someone she had met through mutual friends, and he was three years older than her, 21 years old at the time. During this time, he was working as a security guard at the Carousel Casino in Pretoria. In the beginning of their relationship, the first few weeks were absolute bliss, as they usually are, with the couple looking absolutely smitten with one another. But things are not always as they seem. Just three days before her murder, Annika and Niku broke up. The reason behind the breakup, according to Niku, was that Annika did not take the relationship as seriously as he did. To her, he believed that she just saw it as a casual fling. However, on the other side of the coin, according to Annika's friend, Niku had a jealous streak. He would often become angry with Annika for having male friends. One incident when the couple were at Action Cricket became quite heated after Annika was on the phone with the male friend who wanted to end his life. She was talking him down from the proverbial ledge when Nico, in front of everyone, accused her of sleeping around. After that incident, Annika had supposedly told a friend that she wanted to end things with him. A neighbor and family friend would also testify that he witnessed a fight between the two, where she had tried to kiss him, but he got physical, pushing her away on multiple occasions. Fast forward to the day in question though, where Nico would later tell the police that he was working the entire day. He did, however, then follow that statement up with something that raised a few eyebrows. He claimed that the entire day the two had been texting and that he was due to meet up with her later that afternoon. Police officials and, might I add, the media believed that Nuku was potentially the one to blame for the murder. And so, before an arrest was even made, he was persecuted and marked as guilty on social media. Two months after Annika's murder, he was arrested on the 17th of May 2010. He would later receive bail of 10000 Rand on the 19th of May, two days later. From the very beginning, he protested his innocence and he even had an alibi for the day in question. But social media users believed otherwise. And the unfortunate dark side of social media reared its ugly head. Niku's friends, family, and even himself began to receive death threats. And this would go on for months as preparations for the trial were underway. Bail conditions during this time prevented him from making contact with any state witnesses. But he wasn't given a list, so for fear of contravening his bail conditions, he avoided all of his friends. And do you know what? Five minutes into the long-awaited trial on the 14th of September, it was announced that the state were withdrawing all charges. There were two main reasons for this decision. For one, the video footage of cameras at the casino initially entered into the case had from the very beginning provided a clear alibi for Niku's whereabouts on the day of Annika's murder. And secondly, his DNA did not match the DNA that was found at the crime scene or on Annika's body. And so, if you were listening and assumed that Niku was the man behind this tragic murder, you would be mistaken. But... He would not be the last to face the firing squad. Before I go any further, I must make mention that a judicial inquiry into the murder of Annika Smith was ordered in July of 2010. Most importantly, I would like to explain exactly what is meant by that term, especially for those who are unfamiliar with South African law. Within a judicial inquiry or inquest, the state will provide evidence to the court, which will then allow them to question all persons of interest based on the evidence collected. These individuals or persons of interest are not suspects, but rather people who are believed to be able to provide further information, which may very well lead to the case being solved. Basically, it allows all of these individuals to testify in front of a judge who will ultimately decide whether charges will be proceeded with. And if that is the case, someone can actually end up being charged with the crime that was committed. In this case, Annika's murder. 
Annika's mother and father, her ex-boyfriend Nico, as well as two other students from her school were initially added to that list. So you may have heard me say that list over again and be like, wait, Bella, Annika's parents are persons of interest? What? Well, Charlotte was in another province entirely at the time of the murder in question, but Johann Smith was interrogated thoroughly by police, much to the surprise of the public and, of course, social media. But before I get into what went down with the questioning, let's learn a little bit more about Johann Smith's actions on the day of Annika's murder. That day, he had dropped Annika home and headed to work as normal. He had then attempted to make contact with her in the afternoon when the pharmacy were delivering, but failed to do so. That afternoon, when he returned home from work, he saw that the security gate as well as the front door were unlocked. The dogs were also not in the front yard. Upon entering the home, he noticed that things appeared to be djurmaka, basically a mess in Afrikaans. He then called out to Annika multiple times, fearing the worst when she didn't respond. As he progressed further into the home, he noticed there were overturned dining room chairs and there was blood on the wall. He then proceeded to Annika's bedroom, where he opened the door, saw her lying there, and then in absolute shock, went right away next door to his longtime friend and neighbour. When he reached the front door of the neighbor's home, he told his friend that he believed his child had been murdered and asked him to please accompany him back to the Smith home. According to the neighbor, who had known both Annika's father and mother for a period of 23 years, he described Johan as never being an angry father. He always had a soft spot for his only child, his Annika. The two men then went back into the Smith home. Upon entering Annika's room, they were met with the sight of her body. She was lying on her back with her head turned to the right. Johan had, in a few moments before allowing his friend into the room, thrown a towel over her lower body in order to protect her modesty. I can imagine that no parent would want to see their child in that state. Although the later crime scene photos would showcase that her legs were bent, the witness testified that he was a hundred percent certain that he saw her legs next to one another, relatively straight, when the two men had entered the room. Johann's friend and neighbor, horrified, then exited the room, with Johann Smith in tow. It would later come to light that Johann had attempted to call the police, but there was no answer. Yes, this is actually a thing that happens sometimes in South Africa, so it's not entirely that far-fetched. Another neighbor, however, managed to get through, and within 30 minutes, there were multiple officers on the scene. Johann Smith stayed at that same neighbor's home that night, whilst the forensic team completed the work in his house. Although an affidavit detailing the events of that night was given by the neighbor in June of 2010, it allegedly went missing from the records. However, there was a second affidavit that was given the next day, and that one would somehow remain in evidence. Interesting. Right, so now that you're up to speed, it brings us back to the questioning of Johann Smith. The police officials maintained that it was all just part of standard procedure. However, as you can imagine, the media and social media were a buzz. Most people like a good scandal, let's be honest. After being questioned for three hours straight, Johan was quite irate, to say the least. He had said, I'm trying to deal with the death of my child, and then I get this kind of drama. I don't know how to handle it. They intimidate you with questions and sh what must I tell these people? They say I am lying and talking shit. But the interest in him didn't really stop there. In the years and testimony that followed, after a photo showcasing a mark under his eye made the rounds, his character was once again delved into. It would later come to light that the photo of the mark that many believed was a defensive wound was actually taken on April 6th of 2014, four years after Annika's murder. And no, it was obviously not a defensive wound, but rather it was a scar that was left after a surgery he had to remove a malignant tumor. 
try to tell that to social media at the time though. When speaking to his character in the testimony of later years, the neighbours of Johan maintained that they did not witness any fights out of the ordinary in the Smith home. In the same breath, it was also stated that they respected each other's privacy. Johan was described by many as a doting and loving father who poured his attention and love on his daughter, his only child. Annika. Ex-boyfriend and father aside, the attention then fell onto another student who happened to attend the same school that Annika had. He was a young man and a student at Gerrit Maritz High School. He would only be named publicly weeks after the inquiry into him began, and that was only due to an unplanned development, which you will hear of shortly. This young man's name was Damien Triby, and as I mentioned, he attended the same high school as Annika, and was 18 years old at the time of her murder. He had a twin sister and he was a bit of a rebel, like many other teenagers are, but not to the extent that his family were worried about him. He was a year older than Annika and in the grade above her. The two weren't really friends either, but were acquaintances, as on occasion Annika would apparently approach his friend group for a cigarette during the school's break time. His home was also coincidentally right by Annika's, and on multiple occasions they would walk home together. However, he had never been inside her home. One of the initial things that interested the courts the most though was that Damien was not at school the day of Annika's murder. He would however state that he was at school, however he had left in the morning after he got into a fight with his girlfriend after receiving a letter from a girl in a lower grade. Classic high school scandal for you. Bunking school was not unusual for him, so he had left. He had returned back home and picked up his violin. No, not to serenade the girl of his dreams, but rather to sell so he could buy her a teddy bear from the crazy store. What brought him onto the radar of the police though was that in the days following Annika's murder, schoolmates noticed scratch marks on his neck. And this is where the story gets a little interesting, to say the least. Damien would state that the scratch marks on his neck were from an altercation he had with his sister a few days after Annika's death, where she had accidentally scratched him. What had happened was that day she wanted to go and visit her boyfriend as they had just had a fight. However, she was not in a good state of mind and so Damien wanted to stop her from leaving. He had then positioned himself in the doorway and he had blocked her from exiting the home. It was at this point that she had apparently lashed out at him and this is how he had ended up with the scratch marks on his neck. When it came time for testimony to be given by himself and his family members, their testimony, according to Nico Fenter's lawyer, appeared to be almost identical, which signaled to some that it may have been a rehearsed story. His girlfriend at the time was also asked about the incident and she had corroborated his version of events. The part of his testimony that ended up blowing up on social media though was the discovery of Mixit conversations he had been a part of. For those of you who aren't aware, Mixit was a South African messaging service app, much like BBM or similar to WhatsApp. It was actually created right here in the Western Cape in Stellenbosch. Not only were you able to communicate with individuals that you knew, but the app also gave you the ability to join chat rooms and meet all kinds of weird and wonderful people. I'm pretty sure I'm giving my age away here, but literally the main thing that you would write to everyone new is ASL. If you know, you know. The added bonus was that it cost virtually no airtime and data to access, so it was the perfect solution for majority of teens. Damien's username was Vampire on the messaging service, and in the messages that were discovered, he was conversing with an individual whose username was Satan Eyes. Don't ask. The messages showcased in court went a little something like this. As an English literature and languages graduate, I would just like to add that reading this type of short form speech drives me nutty. But I digress. Let me continue. Vampire. Will you give me one ritual? I want to see a person dead. Do you have a ritual to kill? Satanize. Okay, go to the graveyard, get some dirt. 
a shoebox and an item from that person. Place it onto a doll and visualize what you want to happen to this person. Channel all your hatred into it, then place the doll in box and bury it with sand and take shoebox, go to the cemetery, bury the box and cover it in sand. Vampire. That it? Whew, I think that pained me a lot more to read than it pained you to listen. As you can imagine though, as soon as that evidence came to light, links to the occult and Satan were immediately made. These were later denied by himself as well as those who knew him. Damien did however state that his group of friends were into the occult and one of them was into Satan. A book of spells was also later found in his room and he also confessed to potentially having a shot of blood at a party, which he stated was purely for curiosity's sake. Okay, wait, I know what you're thinking. Let me explain. He would later testify that he had attended a party when he was young and stupid. And upon entry, he was offered a dark red shot, which he had taken and consumed. Later that night, however, he had seen people drawing blood with syringes and he had put two and two together and done the math on that one. When asked about his occult ties, he said he found value in the association with these occult interested friends as it resulted in others fearing him and thus he was not the object of bullying in school. Anyways, these messages made their way to social media and soon Damien was being referred to as a vampire. In posts that were made, although he was not to be named according to a court order in place, someone had posted his face and full name with the caption murderer on Facebook. Given that development, the magistrate then ordered that Damien was now allowed to be named. I mean, didn't really have a choice there, did they? The Facebook page that had been created in memory of Annika Smith also had to be shut down as that particular individual, it wasn't the creator of the page, but someone else had used that platform to post their post. And just on an interesting side note, that individual was taken to court and charged with crimin injuria as well as contempt of court. Yes, from a picture posted in a Facebook group. Because there was a court order in place specifically prohibiting it. Note to self, the law is watching, even in South Africa. Through the legal process though, this individual offered Damien an apology, which he accepted, and then the charges against them were withdrawn. And that, kiddos, is an important lesson for all to learn, especially those who just post willy-nilly online. I'm just saying, don't shoot the messenger. Besides the way in which social media interfered with this case once again, those grammatically incorrect, poorly spelled mixed messages don't really strike me as the work of Satanists or a couple members, but rather a bunch of teenagers playing around being inspired by movies and shows. But I digress. Damien would later tell the court that the messages were sent more than a year before Annika's murder and they had absolutely nothing to do with her. They were related to an issue that his girlfriend had with a family member. This very same girlfriend would later testify that although she was a Christian, she was still interested in movies and shows and books about vampires. Keep in mind that these events and Annika's murder took place during the years where the Twilight and Edward Cullen craze was at its peak. I'm just saying. After she had to defend her movie choices, she was questioned about the infamous messages too. Her username was Penguin on the Mixit application and she admitted to sending a message to the user named Vampire, Damien, asking him if he could get rid of someone. But she added she didn't mean it literally. She was also in that instance referring to someone who was abusing someone she cared about and the court as well as her messages could showcase that the individual they were talking about was very much alive and well. She also mentioned that Damien's interest in the occult was purely a front. The court would then move on to Damien's interest in snakes as they found a scalpel in his home which he used to dissect the reptiles. They also picked up CDs of horror movies and bullet cartridges. This obsession with attributing unusual murders to the occult 
is unfortunately not a new concept. Especially in tight-knit communities, there is often a huge emphasis on showcasing the fact that negative events do not stem from your average community member. There is a need to prove that this absolutely horrible event has an external source that can be blamed. Very much a us versus them sort of situation. But I'll chat more on that in a short while. Now, before you ferociously circle his name on your suspect list, Damien's DNA did not match the DNA found on the crime scene. So that ruled out Damien as far as the state was concerned. For Damien though, he felt as though the damage had already been done. <laughs> For six years, he stated that he was treated like a criminal, denounced and called a Satanist and murderer. And as he spoke out to the media detailing his innocence and his disappointment at the public's condemnation of him, a strange event was brewing just under the surface. And with the only suspect they had ruled out, once again the inquest continued. But in the midst of this grueling and time-consuming inquiry though, another bizarre turn of events took place. Which coincidentally brings us to our next person of interest. On the 17th of September 2016, a 25-year-old man walked into his local police station and confessed to the murder of Annika Smith. So at this point you're like, wait, Bella, what? Someone confessed to the murder? Well, that's it. Case closed. No, actually far from it. So let's learn more about this mysterious man. This man would initially tell police officers that he was sober and coherent and was not under the influence of any substance. He stated that he could not live with what he had done and he wanted to take responsibility for his actions. As per South African law, he was taken to repeat his narrative and confession in front of a judge, which would thus make it admissible in a court of law. He was then arrested facing charges of murder and of a corpse. At this point, once again, the judicial inquest process was put on hold. And just like that, six years after the murder, the news spread once again on social media, much to the shock of those who knew the arrested man. So who exactly was he though? The man in question was Andre Smiley Johannes van Veek. He had completed school up to grade 11 and then attended a college. However, he did not complete his studies there. He was employed as an aircon technician and he lived with his parents in Pretoria North. He had a squeaky clean police record and was in no way associated to the case before his confession. He was a quiet and friendly young man growing up, which quickly earned him the nickname Smiley. And this is the way in which he would be referred to in many of the articles following his arrest. Those who knew him used words like soft and cute to describe him, stating that he didn't even fight in school. They were in utter disbelief. At one of his initial hearings at the magistrate's court in October of 2016, Andre was ordered to a 30-day psychiatric evaluation at Vescopi's Psychiatric Hospital. This was due to the fact that he told the state doctor who examined him that he did not remember what happened at Annika's home that day in 2010. The state physician had said, he cannot describe what happened during the incident and does not remember the relevant facts. He has amnesia about the incident and denies seeing delusions or hallucinations. As many of you may be aware, the mind is a powerful thing. And in order to sometimes protect the body and spirit, it blocks out traumatic or highly emotional events. In some cases though, through therapy, these memories may be able to be accessed again. Once that block shall we call it, has been addressed. Andre ended up spending another 20 days at the request of the hospital, making the observation period 50 days in total. And at the end of it all, he was found fit to stand trial. 
At that point in time, around December of 2016, himself and his legal team opted to not apply for bail. However, a month later, after spending the festive season in jail, as well as receiving the DNA results that they were waiting for, that all changed. On a side note, allegedly whilst in prison, Andre ended up saying a lot to his fellow cellmates. And I mean a lot. He told cellmates that he had raped and killed Annika and buried her hands in a special place. He apparently also admitted that he had cleaned the murder scene. He then proceeded to tell them that he would like to be called Smiley Scissorhands. Yeah, I can't even make this up. And in case you thought it couldn't get worse, it totally could. He allegedly stated that he wanted a tattoo of two hands dripping blood on his chest. So at this point, I'm pretty sure you've decided to yourself that he must be your man, right? Well, although he confessed twice, I might add, after receiving the results of the DNA test, he decided to recant his confession during his bail application. His legal team argued that in the interest of justice, he should be released so that the real killer can be identified. And Andre turned around and basically apologized for wasting everyone's time. He also apologized for giving Annika's family false hope. But wait, there's more. He said that the night prior to his confession, he was at a function at his workplace where he consumed alcohol. After the event, himself and his friends had visited several locations in Pretoria North and Mountain View, drinking all night until they ended up at a club called The Buzz in the early hours of the morning. It was here that a drunk Andre had met a couple. He only remembered the woman, who had blonde hair and green eyes. This unknown pair had then allegedly told him that if he did not confess to the murder of Annika Smith, that they would kill him and his family, whom they all allegedly knew. Okay, giving this narrative and version of events the benefit of the doubt, police investigated the CCTV footage in the location that he had mentioned. And here they discovered that, would you know, there was actually a couple that he had spoken to that night. However, the conversation between the three of them had only lasted no more than 20 seconds. I mean, I am just struggling personally to understand how that entire narrative that he spoke of could be explained in less than 20 seconds. You would really have to be a speed talker and a speed listener, especially when you were inebriated. I'm just saying. And on a side note, his bail application was denied and the case was postponed to April of 2017. Nevertheless though, the story that I have told you was the story he stuck with and the story he has continued to stick with to this day. And when it came time to pursue charges, the state disclosed that they actually didn't have any physical evidence against Andre. All they had were allegations from fellow prisoners and his initial confession, which he recanted. His DNA did not match the DNA found on the scene and his fingerprints were also not found in the home. It would also come to light that the story that he had confessed to was lacking in some details. And so, ultimately, the charges were withdrawn provisionally, and he was released on the 30th of August, 2017. Albeit, he was added to the inquiry list for further investigation, should more evidence come to light. So, if you were sure that he was the offender, according to the courts, that is not the case. Before I get to the last individual who is noted as a person of interest within this case, I want to briefly look at the testimonies of first some neighbours of the Smith family, as well as testimony of two friends of Annika's. As perhaps these testimonies hold clues that may help in solving the case. A nearby neighbour on the day in question had heard a scream come from the Smith household at around 12pm. She went to the backyard to have a look over the fence, but as fate would have it, at that exact moment, she received a visitor at her front door, and that stopped her dead in her tracks. 
She unfortunately then became distracted and after hearing no further commotion from next door, she forgot to even go look over the wall. A direct next door neighbor had left his home at 8 a.m. that morning and had seen the front gates of the Smith home locked with the dogs in the front garden. When he returned home at 1 p.m. though, the front gate was unlocked and the dogs were confined to an area at the side of the home. This account corroborated with the delivery driver's experience of the area too. The last neighbor whose testimony I will make mention of was the long-term friend and neighbor of Johan, the neighbor that he had approached on the day of Annika's murder. His testimony mentioned here was more about Annika and who she was as a person. But bear with me, because soon you will see where I'm going with this. This neighbor would testify during the inquiry, speaking to the fact that Annika had dyed her hair and started painting her nails black too. He deduced that these changes often signaled involvement with Satanism, which he had learned was quite impossible to quit. However, a few months before her death, she had changed her hair color back to blonde, which had led him to believe that she had left the world of the occult behind. Allegedly, her hair would match her moods. When it was black, she was more detached and quiet and withdrawn. When it was blonde, she was her happy, normal, friendly self. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. If I may, for just one moment, highlight the importance of not jumping to rash conclusions based on hair color and nail color alone. That's all. Moving on to Annika's friends. First up, Angelique Fanikarik, who had known Annika since 2004. They were not in the same grade, nor were they best friends, but they did hang out often. She described Annika as someone who was spontaneous and not withdrawn in the least. She spoke to Annika the day before her murder, where she chatted about the relationship issues she was having with Nico. What stuck out in her testimony for me in particular was that she had mentioned that just three weeks before Annika's murder, Annika had arrived at her farmhouse with an unknown man. The man had dark hair and rode a Honda Fireblade motorbike. She only saw this man twice, once that day and once again at Annika's funeral. She would later state that the two of them looked like they were in love. This man was never discovered nor identified. And at the end of the day, all there is to corroborate his existence is her word. And in the grueling process of questioning and cross-examinations, which in some cases it took place over months, more information would come to light. Sometimes far more than any one witness had bargained for. Fine, I'll stop being cryptic and I'll just get to it. In another witness testimony, it was heard how Angelique had witnessed Annika arriving to her birthday party with Angelique's ex-boyfriend. This had infuriated her and she had actually wanted to stab Annika with a knife. And this was apparently how the two had met. However, that witness who had testified to Annika and Angelique's early relationship also stated that they had worked out their differences and became friends after the incident. So you may be wondering who exactly shared this scandalous little tidbit of information though. That would be longtime, extremely close friend of Annika, Henrika Bukes. She was older than Annika, two grades above her, but the two would spend much time together. Both of Henrika's parents were in the police force, and she herself would go on to become a sergeant in the police forensic unit. At the time, however, of Annika's murder, she was five months pregnant. As you heard me state just a few moments earlier, she had given testimony into the early interactions between Angelique and Annika. She also made mention as to how the initial investigating officer in the case at Annika's funeral instructed her to spy on other funeral goers and to keep an eye out for anyone acting strangely or who had scratch marks on them. She, however, was distraught after just losing her friend and all she could focus on was her grief. Understandably so, right? Giving testimony is often not a single day affair and during the period of her giving testimony, she had received an angry message from Angelique 
the girl whose relationship with Annika she had mentioned in her early testimony. It was translated from Afrikaans and it had said, Hi, I am now just reading the lies you got rid of in court. WTF. Henrika had not responded as she was legally barred from doing so as she was still under oath. After receiving yet another angry message from Angelique, she then blocked her. However, Henrika's time in the spotlight was not done there. Henrika was once again at the center of questioning after notes that Johann Smith had been taking after Annika's murder came to light. These notes were made in a bid for him to document all the information he could to aid in a suspect being brought to book. In these notes, it was alleged that Mr. Brink, yet another pupil at the same school as Annika, had been at Annika's home on the day in question, where he had tried to have intercourse with her. Allegedly, she had denied him and he had assaulted her, but the attack had gone too far. He had then contacted Nico Fenter. All of this information had apparently been told to Johan by Henrika. However, when being cross-examined, she denied the allegations made and claimed claimed that the notes amounted to lies. And so, as you can see, the plot continuously twisted and turned, with one finger being pointed at another. But the only thing that was a certainty was that there was a lack of evidence to definitively prove any of these theories. Once again, we cannot know the truth as it is a matter of he said, she said. What we do know, however, is that Reino Brink was added as a person of interest after that revelation came to light. Reino was a former schoolmate of Annika's and apparently a friend of Nuku Fanta, Annika's ex-boyfriend. In 2008, he was the last person of interest, for the time being that is, who was added to the inquiry. Upon further investigation, it appears that he submitted two conflicting statements according to the prosecution. The first statement, an alibi for Niku, differed from his second statement. And as all other persons of interest were, he was advised to seek legal representation. In 2019, the inquiry into the murder of Annika Smit was put on hold indefinitely though. Andre van Veik, Nico Fenter, Damien Tribi, Annika's mother and father, as well as Reino Brink, remain on the list of persons of interest in the case. A judge ruled that the matter would be back in court once everyone was able and ready to continue. As of today, January 13th, 2023, the case has not continued and the murder docket is still open. As I've mentioned, there are many theories floating around, much contradicting information and things that just seem odd and off. Like the fact that multiple statements that were given have seemed to go missing during the course of the inquiry. This case, for me in particular, has also highlighted some of the positive as well as negative aspects of human behavior, particularly on an online platform. Social media is an amazing place, a place to connect with people from around the world, a place to spread information faster, a place to be exposed to cultures and experiences that you may never otherwise learn about. But social media also has a dark side, a side which has appeared time and time again as I have gone through the case today. Often I'm asked to cover stories of developing cases and for the most part I tend to steer clear of them. Purely for the reason that until a guilty verdict is reached in a court of law, an individual is considered innocent. Another example within this case alone of the dangers of social media vilification was the experience of a Facebook friend of Annika's, who after making a comment and a post on his account, found himself in a dangerous position. The man, who I will not name, made a post in February of 2010 on Facebook saying, if a man stabs you in the back, you cut his hands off. Shortly after Annika's murder, someone sleuthing on her profile and on her friends list found his profile, spotted the post, and almost immediately there was a flood of messages on his wall accusing him of being a murderer. And if that was not bad enough, his face was then circulated in an email asking the public to help find Annika's murderer. He called the police immediately offering to come in, but he was not even on their list of suspects. 
months. In just days, however, he lost not only friends, but business to his restaurant. An ode to not only the power of social media, but the propensity for irrevocable damage when spreading false news or allegations. Once again, seen within the individual who shared the image of Damien despite a strict court order being in place. And on the topic of false news and rumours, as I mentioned earlier, attributing strange murders to the occult and Satan is unfortunately not a new nor rare phenomenon. Just google satanic panic if you don't believe me. I have also spoken about it in a few episodes which you can check out. South Africa was also interestingly the first and only country in the world to create our very own occult special unit. The point is you can only trust and believe the facts. Calling Annika out for being a satanist because she dyed her hair painted her nails or had tattoos makes no logical sense. Attacking and accusing persons of interest of being guilty of a crime without having any evidence to prove or disprove a theory isn't right, legal or fair to be honest. I believe that every single guilty offender as well as anyone involved in a crime whether directly or indirectly deserves to be punished for their actions but this punishment needs to follow the correct procedures because at the end of the day if we just persecute anyone we want without any real evidence how does that make us any better than the bad people out there it doesn't change or erase any crime that was committed. However, it may very well alter the life of an individual who may be innocent. A case in point, the mob justice murder of an e-hailing taxi driver, Abongile Mafalala, who was attacked and stoned to death after the community wrongly believed he had abducted a child. As a community and as individuals, we need to be better than that. No, we have to be better than that. We can't allow our anger and hurt to cause us to lose sight of the memory and the individuals we are fighting for. Annika would have been turning 30 years old this year. She may have been married, she may have had kids, but she never had the opportunity to reach any milestones. She never even lived to see her 18th birthday. Her killer is still free. Her killer still walks amongst the community. Her father put out a plea in 2021 saying, Someone, somewhere has to know what happened. Somewhere, someone may be thinking, I can't live with this anymore. Come forward and say what happened. One must be realistic, but you must also hope. Annika's bedroom door is shut now as if to keep the horrific memories inside. Beside her door, there is a wall hanging with a prayer on it that reads, God, where there is darkness, let there be light. Where there is sorrow, joy. I hope one day in the very near future, I'm able to update this case to let you know that justice for Annika Smith has been served. Until then, if you have any information on this case, please do not hesitate to get in touch with authorities. You can make a difference. Until next week, my loves, stay safe, stay vigilant, stay blessed, and stay the amazing human beings that I know each and every single one of you are. Bye!